what can be done to prevent another Deepwater Horizon disaster and what went wrong in the Gulf. The easy answer would have been, well, it's just BP being BP. Uh, we found, however, that it was more than just BP. The head of the President's Oil Spill Commission discusses the panel's report, points fingers, and says Congress needs to act now. They discount or fail to observe the 65 years of history we've had in the Gulf. The oil industry's top man in Washington talks about the report and accusations his group put profits ahead of safety. And it's all about the future at the Detroit Auto Show. And it's not just GM and Nissan electrifying the crowd, just about every automaker stepping into the electric vehicle arena and betting these are the cars of tomorrow. This is Energy Now. I'm Susan McGinnis. Welcome to Energy Now, a weekly look at America's energy challenges and what we're doing about them. The Deepwater Horizon disaster exposed pervasive safety problems in offshore oil drilling and an industry that fought regulation to save money. That's the conclusion of the Presidential Commission investigating the Gulf oil spill. Its full report is out and it details what it calls a culture of complacency, how risky decisions were made until they climaxed in the deadly explosion and the massive oil spill. The Commission says it might happen again unless both the oil industry and the government over safety top to bottom. The panel wants the entire oil and gas industry to build a new safety culture, including an independent safety overseer like the one the nuclear industry created after Three Mile Island. An independent and expert government agency to regulate drilling with beefed up funding. And the Commission says both laws and technology have to catch up with the very real risks of deep undersea drilling. Chief Correspondent Tyler Suters sat down with the co-chairman of the Commission, former Florida Senator Bob Graham to talk about the findings and the fallout from the report. The report cites systematic failure within the offshore drilling industry, the community, as one of the causes of this accident. Is it possible that this is just an isolated case? This isn't systemic? When we started our inquiry, that was a question. Was this just an example of a rogue company? And frankly, BP had had a reputation within the industry of having one of the lower standards of safety. They had the the big blowout at, uh, uh, in Texas. They had the oil leak in Alaska. Uh, so they were known to be a marginally safe com company. The easy answer would have been, well, it's just BP being BP. Uh, we found, however, that it was more than just BP. First, it was more than BP because there were other companies, companies that are some of the largest and most global, uh, such as Halliburton and Transocean, that also made serious mistakes contributing to this disaster. Uh, also, it was more than just BP in that other companies in the industry knew about BP's vulnerability uh, and had no mechanism to deal with it. The American Petroleum Institute, the lobbying arm for the oil industry, would take issue with much of what you're saying. And you also, in the report, single out the API, as it's known, many times for its role leading up to the Deepwater Horizon disaster. What did the API do or not do that may have affected the outcome here? Well, we look forward to working with the API and with the industry uh, at large, because we recognize that if we're going to get a sustained commitment to these standards of safety, both those that we're asking the industry to undertake, similar to what the nuclear power and chemical industries have already done, uh, or get Congress to adopt the l changes in law that will increase the ability of the federal government to effectively serve as a landlord, providing stewardship over the property that it owns for the people of America, or as a regulator to protect the safety of the people who are working in this industry, uh, as well as those who are affected by its activities, uh, we know it's going to take the industry's uh, positive involvement. Senator, assuming a lock in Congress with Republicans leading the House, Democrats leading the Senate, 
Where does the implementation for your recommendations come from? Does it come from the White House? What can President Obama do to put these Well, a in substantial place? amount of our recommendations can be accomplished by executive action. For instance, well, we recommend some significant reorganization and upgrading of the training and, and compensation of people who are responsible for the regulation. Uh, it'll take some congressional action in terms of the appropriations to accomplish that, but the actual structural changes can largely uh, be made by the president or more likely by the secretary of the Department of Interior. But a lot of our recommendations uh, are going to require congressional action. As an example, we recommend uh, that 80% uh, of whatever fines may be collected as a result of this be used for restoration of the Gulf. Uh, we think that the Gulf has been battered not only by this incident, but by a long period of supporting the oil and gas industry, and that it's only appropriate that the fines that are paid as a result of uh, unacceptable behavior be largely used uh, to restore that part of America which has paid the price for oil and gas development in the Gulf. The Commission's report specifically fingers the American Petroleum Institute for fighting stronger offshore drilling rules for decades, rules the Commission says might have prevented the Deepwater Horizon disaster. API is mentioned several times in the report, including in this reference. Because they would make oil and gas industry operations potentially more costly, API regularly resists agency rulemakings that government regulators believe would make those operations safer. API President Jack Gerard responds. We don't think it's based in fact. The one particular rulemaking they were talking about, they're just inaccurate, their conclusion's wrong. We were working closely with the department. They were talking about one of our safety standards. They've since adopted that safety standard. Let me get your reaction to, um, to one comment about the government reliance on industry standards. Because the Interior Department has relied on API in developing its own regulatory safety standards, API's shortfalls have undermined the entire federal regulatory system. Uh, could API-supported regulations be stronger? They discount or fail to observe the 65 years of history we've had in the Gulf drilling over 42,000 wells to produce the energy the country needs. From that, they have drawn broad conclusions about the industry. They're not based in fact, and unfortunately, it does a disservice to the 9.2 million hardworking men and women in the industry. American Petroleum Institute has been developing standards for the industry since 1924. They're accredited by outside third parties, they're audited by outside third parties, and they have created a standard for the industry to elevate performance and safety across the entire sector. Those standards found to be faulty by this commission? Well, th those standards are the very ones that the commission recommends be adopted for safety programs moving forward. The first time anything of this magnitude has ever happened was this particular incident. So we need to put that in context and not cast unfounded uh, dispersions on the broader industry because of this one incident. Are they casting unfounded dispersions on the industry? Absolutely. This, this commission's report has reached conclusions suggesting there's a culture of complacency across the industry. They talk That's to three companies in, in this facts. accident, they talk to other companies across the industry. And they also say publicly that many other companies across the industry have excellent programs that they have no recommendations that they should change. So at the same time, it's a conflicting report. Out of one side of their mouth, they draw these wild conclusions across the entire industry. At the same time, they commend us for a job well done and adopt the very standards that we've created to improve safety performance. When do you think we can resume drilling if you agree safety needs to be improved? The moratorium in the Gulf of Mexico was entirely unnecessary. We are now down 13 percent in the Gulf of Mexico in terms of the amount of oil that's being produced. We're seeing a rise in the price of gasoline across the country. We need to also get focused on supply in this country, make sure we're bringing adequate supply to the marketplace so it doesn't adversely impact consumers. At the same time, we're improving our safety to develop those valuable resources. Do any safety moves need to be done before more permits are issued for deep water? The oil and gas industry has already moved on its own to improve safety. We've worked with the regulators. They've imposed a number of new standards on us. Uh, we're happy uh, to meet those. We need clarity as to exactly what they expect from us. But yes, we should resume deep water oil and gas production as soon as possible. As soon as the industry meets these 
new standards. As soon as the regulators allow us back out there to produce the oil and gas the country needs. Well, next up, the co-chairs of the commission are scheduled to appear on Capitol Hill for hearings January 26 with the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and then the House Natural Resources Committee. Well, another criticism in the report is that oil spill cleanup technology hasn't changed in decades. In the Gulf oil spill, crews used booms to contain the oil technology that's been around since World War II. In the early 1940s, there was concern about wartime bombing of harbor oil tanks and what to do if that happened. Check out this energy then from Australia in 1941. <laughs> Australian authorities try out a bright idea for confining dockside oil fires within a limited area. If storage tanks were bombed, millions of gallons of blazing oil might flow over the water, doing untold damage. Maritime services officers designed these floating booms, with which danger spots will be enclosed in an emergency. Only a hundred gallons of old oil caused this terrific blaze. Imagine what a million gallons would do. The Sydney Fire Brigade and ARP officials conduct these tests, which prove that the booms thrown round the affected areas hold the burning oil within bounds while the firemen go to work with a new chemical firm extinguisher. Well, believe it or not, that technology is pretty much the same 70 years later. The same basic booms were spread all over the Gulf last summer, and they had what the President's Commission calls limited effect. The commission said there's been no improvement in spill response technology in at least 20 years, despite all the advances in offshore drilling. Well, coming up on Energy Now, electrifying the Motor City. Goodbye, Detroit muscle. Hello, Green Machine. I'm Lee Patrick Sullivan in Detroit, and I'll be taking a look at the electrification of the North American International Auto Show. Coming up. Plus, protecting the air we breathe, a look at the 40-year-old Clean Air Act, what it's accomplished so far, and what it might be able to do in the future. Even an Iraq vet like me who's in really good shape needs good health care, especially when it's top quality and convenient. And it's not just for men. In fact, aren't you a vet, Patricia? Yeah, I served in the Air Force. So why not come in today? When you check in, you'll get a full medical exam, first thing free for vets at the VA. So check us out and see you here. Welcome back. Let's get you plugged in now to the top energy news. As much of the country deals with freezing temperatures and lots of snow, comes word that 2010 has tied for the warmest year on record. The government's air and oceans expert NOAA and NASA both say worldwide surface temperatures averaged 1.12 degrees higher than the 20th century average, tying the record set in 2005. The decade that just ended included nine of the 10 hottest years on record. A huge merger, Duke Energy is acquiring Progress Energy for almost $14 billion, making it the nation's largest electric utility. Analysts say the combined company could offer lower rates to customers and invest in new clean coal technology and nuclear plants. The new utility would have the most customers in the nation, more than 7 million in six states. The EPA has yanked Arch Coal's 2007 water permit to expand its Spruce Mountaintop Mine in West Virginia. It would have been the largest largest mountaintop operation in the state, but the EPA says too many streams would be damaged by the mining. It's the first time EPA has ever canceled a water permit. And biomass will be exempt from the EPA's new greenhouse gas regulations for the next three years. EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson says biomass qualifies as a form of clean energy. The biomass industry says its fuels are carbon neutral because plants only release the carbon they absorbed while growing. But some environmentalists argue biomass shouldn't qualify as clean energy, saying some have even greater climate impacts than fossil fuels. Well, the new Congress isn't wasting any time trying to rein in the EPA's power and strip away those new regulations. House Republicans say the new rules will kill jobs and have introduced several bills to try to stymie the EPA. At the heart of the fight, the Clean Air Act, which just marked its 40th anniversary. Energy Now's Dan Goldstein takes an in-depth look at the Clean Air Act's history and whether it is the right legislation for today's climate battles in this Energy Now Spotlight. Air pollution reached what officials call unsatisfactorily high levels. The air pollution was so bad I had to pull off the highway 
because I couldn't see. It doesn't make sense to say we cannot afford to protect our environment. The year was 1970. Americans were tired of choking on a sea of pollution, and they demanded change. Working people saying, we don't need this air pollution. It's affecting our health, and it's affecting our welfare, and we need to clean it up. The response was the Clean Air Act, groundbreaking legislation signed by President Richard Nixon. Leon Billings, a young aide to Maine Senator Ed Muskie, helped write it. We had an air pollution episode in Washington, D.C., while we were writing the Clean Air Act, we were sitting in a conference room and looking out the window, and the smog was pervasive. And a senator from Virginia named William Spong said, we can't not respond to this problem. The bill was just 38 pages long, but had far-reaching effects, from limiting air pollution and getting lead out of gasoline to changing how citizens could demand action. Before the 1970 Clean Air Act, there was no concept of citizen suits allowing citizens to go into federal courts to enforce mandatory requirements on a federal agency. Simply didn't exist. Unprecedented. We wrote into the law that the auto industry had to achieve a 90 percent reduction in auto emissions. Unheard of in, 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 in federal law. Major corporations argued it couldn't be done. It would be too expensive and would hurt the economy. Mobile Oil ran an ad calling the act a $66 billion mistake. Four major CEOs of these companies, General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, and uh, American Motors, they went to the White House to talk to the president about it. They went to the Congress and talked to them that the Clean Air Act should not pass. Bill Ruckel's house was the EPA's first administrator. The Clean Air Act passed the House 374 to 1. It passed the Senate 74 to nothing. So their impact on the political system was essentially zero. Despite their alarms, it took automakers just four years to make their cars clean enough to meet the new standards. We wrote those emission reductions into the law, the 90 percent reduction, based on what we knew had to be done. But we had n no idea of whether it could be done. The law even found an unlikely ally in President Richard Nixon. Shall we make our peace with nature? and begin to make reparations for the damage we have done to our air, to our land, and to our water. Despite Nixon's support for the act, some say it was more about the upcoming 72 election than his concern for clean air. I don't think Nixon had a bone in his body that cared about the environment. We've never had a president before or since, with the possible exception of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who had anywhere near the environmental record that Nixon did. And he was a reluctant warrior, I'll tell you. Uh, but nevertheless, he was a warrior. And so was Ruckel's house. He used the act aggressively, suing a number of cities to demand improvements in air quality. And it worked. According to the EPA, the act in its first 20 years prevented more than 200,000 premature deaths, nearly 700,000 cases of chronic bronchitis, and 18 million cases of lung disease in children. But some say the economy has paid a price. I think we could still have uh, clean air um, without all of the unnecessary underbrush that's grown up over the years. Jeff Holmstead ran the EPA's air division under President George W. Bush and is now a lobbyist for a number of power companies. He says parts of the Clean Air Act have worked, but it often smothers businesses with red tape. There is no doubt that the that the permitting uh, hurdles that you have to go through to build a big industrial plant are are much much um, more difficult to, to overcome in this country than in other countries. And as a result, you do see much more heavy manufacturing moving to other countries. And, and I don't think that's been a good thing for this country. The environmental laws have not been a threat to our economic development. It, they've shown that it's not a choice between economic growth and environmental protection. The two go hand in hand. California Congressman Henry Waxman wrote the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act clamping down on pollutants that caused acid rain and ozone depletion. We've cut the air pollution problem, air pollution by 60 percent at a time when our economy was growing 200 percent. So it certainly didn't impede the growth of the economy. Now the challenge of balancing environmental protection and economic growth is entering a new frontier. EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson wants to use the Clean Air Act to regulate carbon emissions. Not only 
is she going to? She has to. The Supreme Court has held that carbon dioxide is a pollutant within the context of the Clean Air Act. So she has to look at what tools there are in the Clean Air Act which will allow her to regulate carbon. CO2 is just completely different and so if we were to reduce our CO2 emissions by 20 percent that doesn't really make a difference in terms of the overall global problem because a ton of CO2 that's emitted in New York has exactly the same effect in New York as a ton of CO2 emitted in Shanghai or Bangkok or and so it's just a very different type of problem and it's the type of problem that the Clean Air Act just was not designed to deal with. So at age 40 the Clean Air Act faces a midlife crisis. Can it confront environmental problems unheard of at its birth. If it's used uh, aggressively to deal with climate change, that it will force Congress to step in and, and fix that part of the act. And I, I think there's a good chance that we will see that. So um, there is no doubt that the Clean Air Act has been remarkably successful. Uh, but there are also ways in which it needs to be fundamentally reformed. Forty years after those protests, what role the Clean Air Act will play in the future remains a question. But the Act supporters say its impact is absolutely clear. Probably breathing a lot cleaner air, which means that if you're not smoking, you're going to probably live a lot longer. And that, that's something. Not too many laws can say that. In Washington, Dan Goldstein, Energy Now. As Dan mentioned, the EPA is now using the Clean Air Act to begin regulating carbon emissions. Texas is challenging the EPA on that authority, but the state suffered a legal setback. A federal appeals court has decided the EPA can proceed with regulation in Texas. Still ahead, cruising along in an EV. Electric vehicles steal the show in the heart of Motor City. A look at what's coming to your showroom when we come back. to be perfect to be a perfect parent. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. The first two electric cars have just hit the mass market, the Volt and the Leaf, but you ain't seen nothing yet. At this year's North American International Auto Show in Detroit, it was all about the EV. Energy Now's Lee Patrick Sullivan was there and shows us what's in store in this Energy Next. Now you can't see it right now, but on the other side of that sea of cameras is the Chevy Bolt. It won the North American Car of the Year. It's the first time an electric car has won Car of the Year. And given what's going on upstairs in the showroom, that's no surprise. Now I've been going to the auto show in Detroit my entire life. This photo of me and my dad was taken at the 1979 show. Now one thing has always been a given. It was a chance for horsepower to flex its internal combustion muscles. Now back in those days, this is the closest an electric car ever got to the main floor, but this year it seems like they're everywhere. Now this whole electric craze started out with just the Toyota Prius, Nissan Leaf and Chevy Volt, but now it's exploding faster than electrons through a conductor. Every major automaker now has some version of an electric or hybrid vehicle. Ford didn't stop at just one, rolling out four different electrified rides. We recognize that our customers will have a range of needs that can't be satisfied finding one solution. In the year 2000, when the Toyota Prius made its first appearance in North America, it was shunned by critics. Gas was cheap, and the Detroit Auto Show was going SUV crazy. Today, Prius is the marquee name when it comes to hybrids, selling more than 900,000 cars worldwide. And Toyota came to Detroit fully loaded and unleashed an entire range of Priuses. Or is it Prii? Well, anyways, they have a plug-in hybrid and a larger Prius V. So when Toyota rolled out the Prius for the first time, uh, the folks down on the, the block there, General Motors, they were rolling out their H2, mm -hmm. the Hummer versus the Prius. 
and who's left standing? <laughs> Well, I think it has been proven that the Prius wasn't just a fluke and that we weren't crazy. Toyota is also teaming up with Tesla to make an all-electric version of its RAV4. One big advantage to having all of these electric cars at the auto show, indoor test drives. In fact, the entire basement of the Kobo Convention Center in Detroit was one big EV test track. I took a Chevy EV truck conversion for a spin to ask one of the organizers what happened to the auto show of my youth. But where are the GTOs? Where are the Corvettes? Where's the Detroit muscle? Oil? Pretty <laughs> no, much going to be electrification? I don't think so. I, you know, I think, I think if you talk to any of the automakers, they're going to tell you that you know, the electrification of the vehicle is, is not going to uh, completely take over. They're still doing significant um, upgrades and improvements to uh, internal combustion engines as well to get as much efficiency. Case in point, the TDI diesel engines the folks over at Volkswagen are selling. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Diesel is dirty, but not anymore. In fact, two years ago, the Green Car Journal gave the Jetta Diesel TDI its top award. And talk about gas mileage. We've had some uh, record holders, people that have driven the Jetta TDI across the country and have gotten over 50 miles per gallon out of a Jetta TDI. That is like, that's like the golden number, 50 miles per gallon. Every company here would love to have 50 miles, but people really don't know about the clean diesel, it, it, that it can do it. You, I think, you know what I think it is? I think it's marketing. So we have, I do this up myself, I have a leaf. Now, I think if you guys had like a, a fancy little leaf or something like that on your car, then people would recognize how clean this car is and how fuel efficient. You, you think this will catch on or no? No? <laughs> Maybe we need to slightly redesign that leaf. Okay. We'll certainly look into it. So I shouldn't, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be an artist anytime soon. Maybe not. Okay. Now, all this talk about sustainability may have more to do with vehicles like this than it actually does about saving the earth. You see, this is the Ford F-150. It is the best-selling vehicle in the entire world. In 2016, new fuel efficiency standards go into effect, which means all automakers have to average 35 and a half miles per gallon for their entire fleet of vehicles. So every EV and hybrid that a company offers, they can sell more of these. And frankly, this is what pays the bills. In Detroit, at the North American International Auto Show, Lee Patrick Sullivan, energy now. Ford is getting into the charging business, teaming up with a company called Leviton to sell home charging stations for the Ford Focus EV. The units are not hardwired, so if you move, you take the station with you. Well, what do you think of electric cars? Would you get one? Do you think a lot of them will be sold? We want to hear from you. Know what you're thinking and what you want to know. Tell us on Facebook. Search Energy Now News. Give us your opinion. And that's it for this week's Energy Now. Check out our website for extras from this week's show at energynow.com, including my in-depth conversation from New Orleans with two other members of the President's Oil Spill Commission. Also, look for us on Twitter and YouTube at Energy Now News. We'll see you next week.